Hello and welcome to The Quest on Rajya Sabha TV. I'm Rakhi Bakshi. This show gives you a deep insight into the life, career and vision of a leading personality. The guest this time on our show is a renowned scholar, an eminent politician, a very senior member of the Congress Party and very senior member also of the Rajya Sabha Parliament of India, Dr. Karan Singh. Welcome to the show, sir. And of course, let's go back to your early days, first of all. Born into a royal family to Maharaja Hari Singh and Tara Devi, what were those early years like? Well, they were rather unusual, shall we say. First of all, I was born in France by just a quirk of circumstances. I came back to India when I was six weeks old. And then I grew up. For the first five years, I was living with my mother. And then at the age of six, my father set up a separate establishment for me in a separate building with British guardians and two companions and a whole set of servants and all. So for six years, I lived uh, separately. What was that parents. world like? Well, that was a world by itself. It was a self-contained world. I used to meet my mother thrice a week and my father once a week. It was an unusual uh, childhood, shall I say. But I think that my father realized that being an only son, uh, I'm likely to be spoiled in, in the court atmosphere. So mm. he did that. And that went on for six years. And then at 11 plus, I went off to Doon School. And that was then bound up that establishment. Next four or five years, I was at Doon. Uh, I used to come for my holidays. Uh, remember, this is a bifocal state. Yeah. It is Jammu and Kashmir. Yeah. So in the summer holidays, we used to come to Sirinagar, mm. and the winter holidays to Jammu. And then, uh, then, I, then I developed, and things moved very fast. I so you went to problem. Doon School, so a school where there were other people, other boys, and Lots there you of other people. and you came here to again a uh, sort of an area which was more confined and more strict in its regimen, maybe. So how was it like? How did you kind of... You mean how was Doon like or how was that How was like? the balance like, I would say? Well, I disliked uh, my, uh, my early terms at Doon, let me tell you, because I had come from a somewhat protected background. That's exactly what I was. Food was unedible. Apart from other things, it was during the Great War, so there was rationing. Food was inedible. And um, it was tough, you know, because I was... Uh, I look, have to look after myself. But I learned a great deal. Had I not gone to Doon, yeah. I would not have been able to make the transition to democracy. That I'm certain of. Had I gone to one of the so-called princely uh, schools. Unlike many other normal children, your childhood was different and unique. Also, there is a deep sense of history which was there around you. There was a sense of history. I remember my father going in boat processions and uh, the Sarah, big huge the Sarah parades and all. And then that suddenly disappeared. In fact, a darbar was on when the raiders went to Mahura, the powerhouse, and the light suddenly went off uh, in October, October of 1947. And there was a turmoil, total turmoil. I was on a wheelchair, by the way. Mm -hmm. I had been hospitalized for six months in India. I, I wasn't able to walk. I was in a wheelchair. Then we, we came down to Jammu. One day, Sadar Patel came mm -hmm. and said, look, this boy has been uh, on the chair for six months. If you do not send him abroad for treatment, he'll spend the rest of his life on a chair. So I was sent to America. Mm -hmm. The whole of 1948, mm -hmm. I was in America. So you missed that period of I missed that period of, of, of terrible turmoil and tension, uh, which uh, immediately followed the accession. Because there was a tribal invasion. Then there was the deep antagonism between my father and Sheikh Abdullah. Uh, and the whole thing was extremely uh, uh, difficult. No, but when you now uh, look back, uh, how do you see it? Do you see it, it as a missed opportunity? Or no, I see it as a blessing in disguise because I was out of that uh, atmosphere. And then I came back in, in the end of February and became 18 in, on the 9th of March, 18, 9th of March 1949 this is. And in April, the next month, my father uh, had to leave the state. He was requested by Sadar Patel to leave the state because Sheikh Abdullah and he didn't get on at all. So at the age of 18, if you please, <laughs> I, on the 20th of June, 49, I was appointed regent. So among many other unique uh, elements in your life, I would say here was an, a young regent at the age of 18. How was that like? Again? That was very, very exciting and very strange and somewhat uh, uh, overwhelming. But I held my own. Uh, of course, I went and broke my leg in an accident the same year, so again I was back in bed. And then at the age of 19, I got married. Yeah, that's again. Uh, my wife was 13 and I was 19. I'm afraid we broke the law, although it wasn't applicable to JNK. And uh, then we grew up together at the age of 21. 
I was elected Sadre Riyasat, hmm. which was the new democratic form for the government, elected by the state assembly. So, in uh, in when I was 21 years old, then 26 years old, and 30. Uh, uh, three years old, th two years old, I got elected. So one would say. Then that again, that changed to governor. Mm -hmm. So for 18 years, I was head of state, first as regent, then as Southern Then, then uh, as governor. So at tho those early days and at an early age when you uh, held such responsibilities, do you think uh, it made you much more mature uh, as compared mm -hmm. to others? At maybe, maybe. I'm a, maybe I can't judge myself, but I do think that. It placed certain responsibilities upon me. I was studying, by the way, all the time. Yeah. When I went there as regent, I was an undergraduate. Yeah. I graduated from the JNK University, of which I was chancellor. Yeah, that's what. Amazing. That's a unique thing. <laughs> then I wanted to do my MA. I did it from Delhi University. Uh, MA previous. And, and your finally. thesis was on Sir uh, uh, No, that was later. That's a PhD. Yeah. At MA, I did have a university record. 1961, I did my PhD on Siri Aurobindo. Why, do, why did you choose him? Because I was, MA was in political science, but by then my interest had shifted to philosophy. And Siri Aurobindo was the ideal link, because he started off as a very ardent nationalist mm -hmm. during the Banga Bhanga movement, 1905. Okay. And then after that, he left and became a yogi in Pondicherry. But I covered that period from 1900, uh, from 18... 93, 1893 when he came back from England mm -hmm. after 18 years in England to 1905 mm -hmm. that p period of his revolutionary life. So do you see somewhere that your own life and all these uh, uh, as you are saying these foreign influences regency in your life and then uh, coming to terms with the whole Indian structure when you look back as in totality how would you look at it uh, the fusion of it all? Well I did have the privilege if you like of spearheading the transition from feudalism to democracy mm -hmm. because uh, that was I was the first person really from the so-called princely order to yeah. come into into the democratic system at age 36 Indradi asked me to join her cabinet mm -hmm. as cabinet minister that so really that was important so and I was very keen to play a role in building India because Jawaharlal Nehru was our hero I grew up reading his books his autobiography his discovery of India and so on and so I was always impelled uh, national politics rather than to get stuck in the state. Mm -hmm. That was where my father differed obviously because he belonged to the uh, older generation yeah. which was involved only in the state. So there's so much that we have to talk to you about and there's so much to Dr. Karan Singh that we would like to know and we would be talking about but after a very short break. You are watching The Quest right now and we are talking to Dr. Karan Singh. So you were talking about those uh, days where you held different portfolios. Yes, that was when I was in JNK. Yeah. My, my life is uh, divided into 18-year segments. First 18 years, I was a student, if you like, and I was a patient. From 18 to 36, I was head of state. At 36 exactly, I become cabinet minister. I can only say that very few people get this kind of opportunity. <laughs> and for 18 years then, I remained member of the Lok Sabha. But how was that political career like and those experiences? It was very interesting because, you know, there were great parliamentarians uh, at that time, most of them in the opposition. There was Hiran Mukherjee, there was Madhu Lemay, there was Nath Pai, there was Somnath Chatterjee. They were brilliant uh, opposition uh, MPs, Bhupesh Gupta in the upper house and so on. So as a minister, I had to answer questions in both houses. It was a tremendous training. I mean, I had done my PhD in politics, but I realized that Academics has nothing to do with the way politics actually works. But it's this was different. a platform where you saw it all happening. This is a platform where I saw it all happening and made some contribution, I think. We are talking about all this at a time when you see parliament and its problems of functioning mm. and all this shouting and uh, sometimes also sadly personal attacks which go on. How do you feel at this time? I feel very distressed, in fact. Um, as chairman of the ethics committee of the Raj Sabha, we came out with a code of conduct. Mm. And the first uh, item there is not to do anything that brings down the prestige of parliament. And these disruptions and these shoutings are all do exactly that. They bring down the prestige and credibility of the whole democratic system. But when I was there first in the Lok Sabha for four terms, 18 years, we never had any such thing. We had bitter opposition uh, speeches, brilliant speeches, but never any direct action, you know, never any... Uh, going into Why the well. do you think all it has changed? I mean, um, we see a certain, of course, uh, degradation, as you are also saying, little sad, but 
how would you look at those times when the opposition would also try and discuss things, get into... You see, that is the whole point. The, the opposition should discuss and should haul the government over the coals if it can and, and make all its points. Now, when the opposition disrupts the house, they don't realize, but they are in a way doing a favor to the government. We don't have to answer any question. Yeah. What they should be doing is to hold the government accountable and responsible as a political scientist. That's what I would say. Yeah. That's what you should be doing. But if you, if you uh, uh, shout and go into the well of the house, the house gets adjourned, there you are. The government doesn't have to give any reply. And sir, since you're uh, head of the ethics committee here also, do you see a certain pattern now in the, ter in the way parliamentarians now behave? And all kinds of things come up, sometimes it is not good. So would you see some kind of a pattern in terms of uh, this? There is a pattern, I think, uh, I think the changing demography of, of, of the houses uh, and the fact that uh, a lot of previously submerged and suppressed uh, sort of sections of the population are beginning to come into the mainstream. Then there are the regional parties who have their own um, agenda. So it has become very turbulent now, I must say. Mm -hmm. And the last few years in the Raj Sabha have not been good. Uh, Though it is supposed to be having, you know, supposed to be of great discussions. Of, and yes, it's supposed to be the House of Elders and all. But it has been very bad. The last session, for example, was a washout. I think the one before that was a washout. So as somebody who's been in Parliament, I came into Parliament uh, 46 years ago. And I was elected four times to the times to the Lok Sabha and four times to the Raj Sabha. Uh, one has seen, I must say, a deterioration of standards in Parliament. I'm sorry to say that. And sadly, sir, also we're talking about morality in public life, and we know recently what has happened. We had two senior minister who had to go, and uh, I can only say that uh, there was an example of you where uh, you know you, uh, that you time resigned that, yes. on moral grounds. Yes. And there was an air crash. So how would you would you look at this whole, let's say, a crisis of morality? Mm -hmm. What can I say? There certainly, I think. Uh, I mean, I don't want to comment on any individual event, but certainly I think there has been again a deterioration of, of standards of, yeah. of, of, of public uh, morality and, and all these uh, scams and things that we have hit us recently. Whatever their reality may be, they have certainly not left a good impression on the general public. So between... But what would you say that being in public life, what would you suggest as a formula or some or, or the or the standard that you're talking about well the standard is clear but the question is how do you achieve that standard and i think really the, the onus is on the political parties to see that their members do not behave in such a manner that brings parliament into disrepute basically because everybody is under the whip everybody is under the control after that act was passed nobody can defy their party and therefore it is a responsibility of the political parties to ensure that their people do not misbehave. Yeah. Well, what more can I say? And, and, and talking about corruption uh, largely uh, in society, again, this IPL match fixing going on. I mean, uh, as a philosopher also, which you are an intellectual, how do you look at this whole society, which is going maybe a period of churning? Or, uh, there is definitely a period of churning. And there is definitely a degradation of values. You see, uh, the value system that was imparted in the freedom movement. Mahatma Gandhi, for example, as you know, lived by the very highest values. Jawaharlal Nehru was our first prime minister for 17 years. There was a certain value system uh, and there was a certain modicum of, uh, of morality that was always there. That seems to have been breached now. So, you know, once you start falling, there's no real end to the thing. Mm. And therefore, I think what we need really is a new cultural revolution in India. A cultural revolution, not of the Maoist type, not violent type, but a psychological, a philosophical, a spiritual cultural revolution in India mm -hmm. is required. Since you're talking about the cultural revolution, I would also talk about um, uh, diplomacy, uh, which again you're heading the Foreign Affairs cell of the Congress Party and uh, talking about our neighbors, whether it's Pakistan or now China. Uh, let's come to Pakistan first. Do you really see this recent election which has happened some kind of a hope in terms of the way it has... I look at it as a positive event, yes. Because uh, Nawaz Sharif has come back after 16 years and may, several of them spent in exile. And I think he's come back a maturer and a wiser man. And I think objectively also the circumstances are such mm. that it is 
clearly in Pakistan's interests to have good relations with India. You and it hope. is in our interest. I see hope. I see hope. I mean, I'm not uh, uh, over optimistic. I'm not ecstatic about uh, the change. Mm -hmm. But the fact that for the first time you had a democratic transition in Pakistan. And uh, what about China, the Chinese Premier? China is a, I met him. He's a very pleasant person, I must say, unlike the earlier leaders who were rather f stiff and formal. He talks easily and laughs easily. And that is as far as personality is concerned. But every nation has their own interests, their core interests, like India has. And uh, when the core interests uh, clash, then one has got to be careful. But again, I feel that we have to sort out our problems with China. We cannot continue like this forever mm -hmm. with an undemarcated border and constant possibilities of incursion and uh, escalation. Yes. There's so much more that we still have to talk to Dr. Karan Singh about, but we'll again uh, take a very short break. Uh, please come back again and watch the show. This is The Quest for you. Hello, you are watching The Quest and we are uh, back again and talking to Dr. Karan Singh. We were talking about China, sir. So, how do you see the road ahead now? This is an important... It's neighbor. a difficult road. Uh, it's a difficult road with most of our neighbours, with Pakistan, with China particularly, <clears throat> with Sri Lanka, with Nepal. But we live in a, a turbulent uh, lo uh, locality in, in this part of the world. And we've got to be prepared to meet the challenges. We have a special responsibility in SARC, hmm. being the predominant country. And we've got to uh, improve our relations with all of these countries without uh, allowing our core national interests to be adversely affected. Now, that's a great challenge, hmm. um, a challenge which our diplomats and our government has to face. But I think we must, we must be prepared to face it. I think that we tend to get if not we, I mean, some of the channels tend to get hysterical at the slightest uh, problem. You know, they almost declare war uh, on, yeah. on Pakistan. Or war. Why, you don't, why aren't you attacking there? What are you doing here? Kya kar rahe ho? Nalai ko kamzor ho, darpo You see, that is not really a mature way of looking at things. You can have criticism. But this sort of atmosphere that is built up, almost of, of hysteria and, and passion. This is uh, not good because it also then uh, cabins and confines the government. Mm -hmm. When public opinion is aflame, even if the government wants to make some uh, conciliatory gestures or wants to come to some uh, uh, agreement. Yeah. Uh, for example, the Bengal situation is an ideal thing. The Prime Minister was going, there was going to be an agreement signed at the last moment there was a tantrum and that That's was what, that. Uh, the, the, the element of maturity mm. that I mm. mean, think that. And uh, talking about again, since you are, uh, you've studied political science, you're an eminent politician, talking about coalition uh, politics today, uh, how would you look at it? Well, that's come to stay. Coalition politics are definitely come to stay now, um, both at the center and in many of the states. And therefore, we have to uh, get used to it. But don't you think there are compulsions sometimes and in the name of compulsion, things happen? They do happen because when you run a coalition government, you can't do exactly what you want. You've got to carry your coalition partners with you. And that is, uh, that is sometimes uh, a constraint. But there it is, that's the way it is. When the people of India throw up a fractured uh, parliament, then what to do? You've got to accept and respect the verdict of the people. Mm -hmm. If the verdict of the people is fractured and fragmented, then the government is fractured and fragmented. Parliament is fractured and fragmented. Yeah. We were talking about uh, sir, diplomacy, and I must also bring in your experience, brief, but uh, to USA as an ambassador. Yeah, that was fun. That was a few months only for seven. I enjoyed it. I've written a book about it separately. But on diplomacy, let me very briefly tell you that there are three dimensions of diplomacy. There's a the classical political diplomacy, which is government to government. There's the increasingly important economic diplomacy, mm -hmm. which is corporation to corporation. And there is the vital cultural diplomacy, which is people to people. As president of the ICCR, my task is to send troops abroad, receive troops from various countries, dance, music, uh, festivals, and so on. So that is very important because that is really, that touches the heart. And you think that's making an, an impact? I, well, I think so. It's very difficult to quantify. But I think that unless we move on all three levels, 
our diplomacy uh, won't really get rid of uh, Another area of concern for you, sir, is environment and uh, especially to protect tigers. You're yeah, I started that. I, I was also responsible for the tiger becoming the national animal. Did you know that? When I took over as chairman of the Indian Board for Wildlife, the lion was a national animal. Oddly enough, I think because of the Ashoka lions. Okay. Yeah. And I said, you know, this is absurd because the lion is found only in one part of India. So we passed a resolution in our first meeting, urging the government of India to change the national animal from the lion to the tiger, which Indraji took to the cabinet and did. And therefore, tiger became the national, and therefore Project Tiger, of which I was chairman of the steering committee. So I've had a long history with that also. I was also talking about books and your association with this academic philosophical world, sir. Um, how do you see uh, this whole world and your own contribution and what you've well, done? It's very uh, difficult to assess. Books, you've written very, I've written books. I've done lots and lots of things. It's very difficult to assess one's own contribution. But I have a sense of satisfaction because I, have, I feel that I have played a useful role first in the state then on the national scene, then in a way now on the international scene with my cultural work. So it gives me great satisfaction that uh, one is able to do something in a world that is torn by tensions and hatreds and all, to be able to bring a soothing touch, as it were, through music. Music is very important for me. It's played a major role in my life. And we have everything now from classical music to rock festivals mm -hmm. in Delhi. Do you go to some I of go, them? I'm a rock addict. Okay, that's I something listen to new. rock music one hour every day. So I love Indian classical, I love folk music, which I myself have composed yeah, in Dogri, yeah. and I love uh, rock music. What about children, sir? I mean, among the two sons? Uh... Three, three children, two sons, a daughter, mm -hmm. and six grandchildren. And by God's grace, they're all growing up. And doing so what, what is the road ahead for Dr. Karan Singh now? And the well, dream? my basic thing is, is a spiritual quest of which we haven't spoken. You'll have to have a separate interview that, with me yeah. about that. In fact, there's I, so much to your I, body of work that we I need I cannot more uh, cover it on this. But the inner quest, I think, is very important. And uh, as long as I can continue uh, to render some public service, I will do so. But meanwhile, I've got to start, continue to grow inwardly if possible. Are you writing something even now? Not really. I'm not speaking more than writing now. Because writing needs a certain amount of spare time. I, I find myself busier and busier, you know. I have the no. ICCR, I have the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library, I have the Orwell Foundation. Yeah, I have all there, sorts you, of things. <laughs> and so I really don't get time to sit back and write. But I do speak a lot and many of my speeches become articles. Later. So what is your message to the India today? My message is to keep the faith, to the young people particularly. Despite all the corruption and all the nonsense yeah, all we see around us and all the negativities, we've got to keep faith in our culture and in our country and in ourselves. Because if we lose faith, then everything is lost. So I mean, if I at 82 can be positive and optimistic. But the young people don't have the that patience. young people sir. don't have that patience, but they've got to learn uh, that their inner fire should not be quenched. It should always be burning. Thank you so much, Dr. Karan Singh, for talking to us and sharing uh, with us all those lovely experiences. And that was Dr. Karan Singh for you. And as I said earlier during the interview, there's so much that uh, one wants to talk to him about. But in a short span of time, this is what we brought to you. And uh, thanks for watching the show. Namaskar.